Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another screencast lecture. Today's topic is sexual reproduction. Some main questions that we will be addressing in this lecture, and we will also have a follow-up lecture on asexual reproduction that will be pretty similar. We're going to be thinking about the questions, what is sexual reproduction? How is sexual reproduction different from asexual reproduction? What are some advantages and disadvantages of sexual reproduction for a species? So let's go ahead and get started. First definition is what is reproduction? Reproduction is the production of offspring. This is going to make more members of the species. What are some characteristics of sexual reproduction? First of all, we have two parents involved. So there are two parents involved in sexual reproduction. As we'll see in a future lecture in asexual reproduction, there is only one parent involved. What specialized cells are required in sexual reproduction? The male reproductive cell is called sperm. The female reproductive cell is called egg. Egg and sperm cells are called haploid cells. We're going to discuss this when we further explore genetics at a future date. Another definition I would like you to know is fertilization. Fertilization is when sperm and egg share genetic material to form offspring. Here you see a picture of tadpoles. A fertilized cell is called a zygote. So when a sperm fertilizes an egg cell, you now have a fertilized cell, and that is known as what's called a zygote. And a zygote cell is called a diploid cell versus a haploid cell, which would be like a sperm or an egg cell. This would be a diploid cell. And again, we're going to discuss this term further when we explore genetics. Let's talk about advantages of sexual reproduction. The biggest advantage and most important advantage probably would be the, that there is a more rapid generation of genetic diversity. So like you can see this picture of different colored flowers, these are all the same species of plant that uh, feature many different variations and vari variations of uh, colors. Now hopefully you remember the term population. This was a term we learned in seventh grade. The population is all of the members of the same species in an ecosystem. Genetic diversity in action. Well, let's consider our good friend, the domestic dog. Uh, here we see a Labrador Retriever on the left. On your left, that's a chocolate lab. In the middle is a yellow lab. And on the right is a black lab. They are all the same breed. However, they do have quite a, ver a range of diversity in colors. And that brings us to the dog itself. At the beginning, you have, and from that evolutionary history, family tree, you eventually go through and end up with our friends, the domesticated dogs, many different uh, domesticated breeds. Now, I mentioned that genetic diversity was important. Well, why? Why is this important to a species? The big thing is, is that with a lot of genetic diversity, is the uh, species is going to be less likely for the entire lineage to be wiped out by an environmental change. 
For example, let's say a new predator comes into the area or a new disease is introduced to the area. That would be uh, examples of environmental change that can threaten the existence of that entire species in the uh, environment. Here, for example, these are plants in South America. The, uh, there was a disease and all of the plants have now, ha now have the disease and are dying. Genetic diversity is gonna serve as a way for populations, that'd be like individual species, to adapt to changing environments. So the key is, is that if there is more variation, with more variation, it is more likely that some individuals in a population will possess variations of alleles. These would be genetic traits. And that's a term we're going to learn more about when we study genetics. But if some of the individuals in a population do possess different variations, these variations might be more suitable for the new environment. Like for example, uh, maybe uh, the um, environment changes enough where it gets much colder that this lighter colored fox will be more likely to survive than this darker colored fox since the climate has gotten colder there's going to be more snow so this lighter colored fox may have a better chance of survival than the darker colored fox. Those individuals that have that that good trait that positive trait they're going to be much more likely to survive to produce offspring that also has that positive trait. So a white fox is going to be much more likely to pass on that genetic trait of being a white fox onto its offspring and then those white fox will have a better chance to survive and so on and so forth. The species is going to continue for more generations because of the success of these individuals. Now let's talk about adaptations. Let's talk about genetic diversity. Let's think about how it relates to survival of a species. First of all, let's think about the goal of a species. Now obviously this is not a conscious goal. This is this would be a, a general idea of the goal of a species itself. The goal of a species itself is for individuals to survive long enough to reproduce they need to live long enough to reproduce more members of the species. Otherwise, the species is going to go extinct. You need new uh, members of the, of the species to continue on the lineage. Adaptations are important, and adaptations are physical or behavioral changes in an organism that is going to help it to survive. It's going to help it to better survive in an environment. And when we're talking about genetic diversity, there could be certain adaptations which will help the individual member of the species survive better in that change of environment and go on and be able to reproduce and uh, pass on those traits onto its offspring. Here, for example, we see several different adaptations. Web feet, feathers, hibernation, playing dead, storing lots of water, sharp claws, building a nest, migration, long beak, camouflage, coloring, traveling in groups, and wings. Web feet, that's going to be a physical adaptation. Other physical adaptations would include feathers, sharp claws, long beak, camouflage coloring, and wings. And the other ones are going to be behavioral adaptations. That would be hibernation, playing dead, migration, building a nest, storing lots of water, and traveling in groups. All of these things have the potential to help an individual of the species survive long enough to be able to reproduce and pass on their genes to their offspring and continue the species so it doesn't go extinct. Now let's think about and consider body shape of various, organ or, uh, various organisms. Body shape of an organism may tell us a lot about that organism as an environment. So if we were just to grab, you know, this random fish, we may not know anything about its environment. I mean, we probably figure the environment is going to be water since it's a fish, but we may, can, we may learn more and more about the uh, specific environment that the, that the uh, fish is in by taking a look at its body shape and different adaptations that it has. 
For example, let's take a look at this mystery organism. Uh, here is its teeth. First of all, what can we predict about its diet? And why do you think that? I'll give you a second. Okay, this organism is going to be a carnivore. And we know that this organism, like for example a wolf, we know that this organism is going to be a carnivore because it has these sharp canines and uh, it has sharp molars as well and those sharp canines and molars are used for tearing meat now if you've ever watched a carnivore eat they don't really chew they'll pull off a piece of uh, flesh a piece of meat and then just swallow it so it's just ripping tearing shredding swallowing not a whole lot of grinding and chewing going on now here's another mystery organism by the way this is the front of its mouth it's just kind of weird this is the front these, this is the back of its jaw. So let's take a look at this uh, mystery organism and get a, trying to get a picture of what you think it would be. Well, in this case, it is a sheep, and this organism is a herbivore. And we know that this organism is going to be a herbivore because it has incisors for slicing. Those are going to be your front teeth. Think of like... Uh, scissors so like if you think about it, when you're biting into an apple it slices into the apple that's your incisors and your molars in the back of your mouth those are going to be good for grinding plant material uh, a, an animal like sh a sheep is not going to be able to just swallow the plant material it's difficult to digest so it takes time in its mouth to grind the uh, plant fibers break them down as much as possible uh, with their molars before they swallow it Okay, this leads us to body shape, and here's a little quick quiz. Which of these fish mouths is best adapted for bottom feeder? We have fish A, fish B, and fish C. Let's get a closer look at each of their mouths. Fish A has a turned up mouth like this. Fish B is, <laughs> is a catfish, it's pretty ugly. Uh, it has a mouth here that's down at the bottom of the, of the fish itself. And fish C, the mouth is kind of smack right in the middle, facing straight ahead. So if you take a look, the, this one is upturned mouth. This one has a mouth that's down at the bottom. And this one has a mouth that's straight ahead. The best one for bottom feeder is B, because then this one, uh, the catfish, can just swim along the bottom. And it can eat off of the bottom of the uh, pond or whatever and it's not going to expose its body very much to predators. If this one, who has an upturned mouth, were to swim at the bottom and try to eat stuff off of the bottom, its, it's body is going to have to be tilted, and it's going to expose a large portion of its body to predators. Same with this one. This one's great for eating in the middle of the pond, so it can just be eat, uh, swimming along. Let's say there's something to eat right here. It can swim right into it and eat it. Uh, what do you think this one is going to be good for, this upturned mouth? That upturned mouth is going to be great for eating things off of the surface. So if there's a bug walking on the surface of the water, this fish can tilt itself up and, and eat from the uh, surface of the, the pond very, very easily. So each of these three different fish have three different body shapes and mouths that would be more appropriate for different types of feeding. Here are some different birds and beaks for different uh, feeding. You could probably guess what this is. This is a woodpecker, of course. And here you can see a woodpecker grabbing a bug with its sharp, pointy beak. Here we have a crane. And the crane has a long, sharp, pointed beak, kind of like a spear for like spear fishing. So here it is getting a, uh, a fish. Looks like some kind of ray here, stabbing it almost like a uh, uh, fish spear. This is a hummingbird and its long needle-like beak is great for sticking its beak into uh, flowers to collect pollen and ne pollen, like pollen and, ne and nectar <laughs> to collect nectar. And here we have a beautiful drawing of a pelican and the pelican is great for scooping up fish out of water. And last but not least, we have a hawk, and this hawk beak, you can see it's this sharp pointed beak here, and that sharp pointed beak is great for eating meat. So kind of like the sharp pointed teeth on our wolf friend, this is going to be great for tearing and shredding of meat.
Okay, let's talk about a famous example of variation and adaptations in a species. Galapagos Island, you may have heard of Galapagos Island. The Galapagos Islands are off the west coast of South America. So here's the Galapagos Islands. Here's uh, Florida, we're way up here. The Galapagos Islands pretty far away. It's famous for their vast number of species, not just their vast number of species, but also like kind of weird species that you're not gonna find anywhere else. One of the examples of that would be these uh, aquatic iguanas. So they have iguanas here that actually jump into the ocean water and swim around and then come back, come back onto the land. And here you see the, whoop, well, uh, that's kind of neat. But anyways, uh, here you see where the Galapagos Islands, that's where they're located. And the Galapagos Islands is also famous for Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin took a trip in the 1800s. He's uh, well known for the theory of revolution. He's well known for the theory of evolution. And he was on a boat called the Beagle. And we'll talk about Charles Darwin sometime again in the future. Hello. What a look in his eye. Oh, yeah, yeah. My problem is I not only saw E.T., I also saw Jurassic Park. In Darwin's day, the giant tortoises were still being hauled away by the thousands to provide fresh meat for whaling ships. That's a little too close to my fingers. You can have it. Now, the Galapagos Islands are a series of islands, and some are bigger than, than others. Some are uh, uh, separated by larger distances. Some are separated by smaller distances. And why this is important is what... One of the things Darwin noticed is that different finches, now these are all the same species, this is the type of bird, they are all the same species, however, different um, examples of finches had different shaped beaks depending on which islands they lived in. And these different beaks would be more appropriate for whatever food is available on that particular island. So the shape of the beak is gonna uh, be a lot more appropriate for different types of feeding. So this type of beak, and we talked about this before, it's kind of like that short pointy beak, which is great for, for picking in logs and, and eating insects versus something else like this, which might be good for breaking seeds, almost like a nutcracker, stuff like that. And here we go, we'll take a look at this, this chart right here. And you can see different beaks are gonna be more suitable for different foods. And on this island, the beak is uh, long and curved. They use that to move dirt around. They dig more on this island than on other islands. They all look a little different depending on the island yeah. they come from. Yeah. Okay. We can try hypnotizing. Oh. Can he fly if he's hypnotized? He'll go to sleep. Mockingbirds joined the giant tortoises on Darwin's list of creatures that, for some mysterious reason, were slightly different on different islands. All right, I will now make this mockingbird wake up. Right. <laughs> so let's compare. Here's a gray warbler finch. You see its beak. Cactus finch. You see its beak. And large ground finch. These three beaks, very, very different. All better for different purposes. Okay, let's take a look at another example. This is a famous experiment from the past, and this is definitely something that I'm going to want you to know about. You don't need to know this guy's name, but Bernard Kettlewell, I guess. He studied these uh, moths called, known as peppered moths in England, in Manchester, England. And I don't know anything about Manchester, but I know Manchester United is a soccer team, and everybody's like, yay, Manchester United, so there you go. So anyways, here are the uh, pictures of the peppered moths, and you might be able to guess why they're called peppered moths, just by looking at the picture. They come in two basic varieties, a black variety and a white variety. And what this fella f noticed is that there's different, um, the different colored moths tended to be more common in different parts of the country of England. So the dark colored moths tend to be more common in this region of the country and the lighter colored white moths tended to be 
in these regions. Now, one of the things that you may or may not know about this region is that this tended to be the more industrialized, like big cities, factories, etc. And this is more rural, more countryside, more farming, and less factories in this area. That's kind of an important feature to uh, remember. So here's a picture. Here we see a tree, and here's a dark moth, and here's the light moth. And when you look at this picture, you might be able to make some observations and think about, well, what's true about the two different colored moths compared to this tree? One of the things about this area is that the trees in this area were covered with this white lichen. So this white lichen is, is covering a lot of the trees, and that white lichen is covering a lot of the trees in these areas. And the reason why is that these are those rural areas, not a lot of industry, not a lot of factories. And that white lichen is a lot more po uh, commonly found in those areas. So if you have that white lichen on trees, it would be very, very difficult for a predator to be able to notice the white colored moth. Now, both moths are in this picture. You probably see the black moth right away. I mean, as long as you're looking vaguely in the direction of the screen. The light colored moth is a lot more difficult to, to spot. Go ahead and give you a second, see if you can spot it. Well, if you look closely, it's right there. So here's the moth, here's his wing. There you go, he's hiding pretty well. Now conversely, here is the tree without the white lichen on the tree. So the white lichen on the tree has been destroyed by all the pollution and soot and all that kind of good stuff and the tree is now dark in color. So now we have the dark colored moth and a white light, light colored moth. In this case now the white colored moth is significantly easier to see, obviously right here. And again, the dark colored moth might be a little more difficult to spot. This one's not as difficult. Here you can see the dark colored moth right here. So kind of side by side, let's take a look at those two pictures. This brings us to the concept, the idea of what's called natural selection. Really an important concept, so make sure you're paying close attention here. Natural selection is a process by which traits can become either more or less common. Like for example, the dark colored moth becomes more common over time because the light colored moth was easier for predators to see. so the dark colored moth became much more common. The individuals with the, benefit, the beneficial trait are gonna be more likely to live long enough to do what? Remember the goal of the species? To reproduce and pass on that beneficial trait. So you have a dark moth, you have a light moth. Now let's say the trees are darker, that light white lichen uh, dies on the trees and now the trees are dark. What, what's not going to happen is the light moth is not going to be like, hey, I'm a light moth, so I'm going to turn into a dark moth. That doesn't happen. What's going to happen is both of these moths already exist. They're both uh, uh, living long enough to have uh, babies and reproduce. In the past, the light moth had an advantage and would be much more likely to have more babies to live long enough. Now with the darker trees, this one now has a greater opportunity and a more of a, uh, a chance just to be able to survive and have more offspring. So the number of black moths is going to increase over time. It's going to become much more common to find black moths over time. Uh, think about like uh, an albino squirrel. and It's not the same thing, but um, I know in my neighborhood we have at least one albino squirrel that runs around. If, uh, if it's in the tree or running across the street, whatever, I mean, he's so easy to spot. That white squirrel, that would not be an advantage uh, for that squirrel's survival. So it would be much less likely to survive um, being a white squirrel than, say, a brown squirrel that blends in with the trees, dirt, grass, etc. Here's another example. Now, this is an example from, the, from a textbook. Uh, this one has actually been kind of criticized, and uh, there's some controversy if this is you know, correct or not, but the idea 
should make a little bit of sense. So like for example, let's say you have a giraffe. If you have a giraffe it, that has a slightly taller neck than his, uh, his, his friends, that, that giraffe with a slightly taller neck would have a better chance of re reaching food that's up higher and it'll get enough food to eat and it will survive and then it will have a better chance to live long enough to have babies and then his babies will uh, also have a better chance to have a long neck so they'll be able to reach up high and eat leaves off the high trees and so on and so on and so on so that could be an idea of how a uh, uh, the necks of the species could be increasing over time natural selection these there are limits to these you know quote improvements so if we think about the uh the longer neck being an improvement i mean there would be a limit i mean you wouldn't want to have a a neck that's you know 50 feet tall that would not be very good that would that would be probably pretty tough for a giraffe to be walking around with with a 50 foot tall neck so like for example here let's let's consider this situation here we have cheetahs now this is uh uh, pretty much true. So if you have a cheetah that has a long leg, the cheetahs with the longer legs tend to be able to run faster than the cheetahs with shorter legs. So if a cheetah has longer legs, it's going to be able to run faster. How would that be an advantage for the cheetah? Well, that's going to give it an advantage because it will be able to run faster. It will be much more likely to be able to catch prey that's running away from it. And if it's able to catch more prey than the uh, slower cheetah, it's going to be more likely to uh, get enough to eat, it's going to be more likely to survive long enough to reproduce again and pass on their long leg genes. However, but now imagine if the, uh, the long legged cheetah, the, the legs keep getting longer and longer. Now imagine the legs of the offspring continue to get longer, giving them more and more speed advantage. That's a, that's a good thing. However, eventually those legs could get too long. Now, if you have really long cheetah legs, those really long cheetah legs would have a more uh, greater chance of, of snapping, a greater chance of breaking. And if the cheetah's leg breaks, it's not like if a person's leg breaks or you go to the doctor and you know, get a cast, etc. If the cheetah's leg breaks, it's probably not going to survive. It's probably not going to be able to live long enough to pass on its super long leg genes. And this is just for fun. <laughs> okay, disadvantages. So we talked about a, the main advantage of sexual reproduction, which was great, greater genetic diversity, being able to survive better in changing environments. Uh, maybe there is a new disease comes in. Some of the individuals are going to be immune and more resistance to that disease. Those are all good things. However, there are some disadvantages to sexual reproduction as compared to uh, asexual reproduction. One of the disadvantages is that there is an increased chance of mutation and genetic complication. So when you have sexual reproduction, and again, we'll get more into this when we study genetics, you're going to have a, a mixing of different genes that process, there's going to be a greater chance that something, something's going to happen. Something's going to get messed up a little bit. Here's a clip. Right out of Ripley's Believe It or Not, but you better believe it, a two-headed baby snapping turtle was discovered in Hudson, Maine, near Kathleen Talbot's home. Talbot says she went outside to watch turtle hatchlings cross the road and make sure they arrive safely on the other side. Now, that may sound like the start of a joke, but when she noticed a hatchling lagging behind, that joke turned into a bizarre but real discovery. He stayed in that hole. I think one head was saying, go this way, and the other one was saying, go that way, so he stayed in the hole. Talbot has given him, or them, two names, Frank and Stein. She says she doesn't plan to keep him as a pet, but wants to take care of him and make sure he survives. He deserves a good chance. Another disadvantage is that the population size will grow at a slower rate as compared to asexual reproduction. Why? Why do you think that that's the case? Well, the big reason is, is that only the female members of the species technically reproduce. If the male of the species is not going to be able to give birth, is not going to be able to 
uh, reproduce. So only the female. So basically, let's say half of the population size is going to be able to reproduce versus an asexual reproduction. All members of the uh, population size are going to be able to reproduce. Another disadvantage is that it takes time. It takes energy to find and court a mate. So to be able to have two parents, they need to be able to find each other, fight for a mate. Sometimes they have to uh, go through different mating rituals, things like that. That all takes time. That all takes energy. This male's appearance and his personality will transform with his fortunes. Meet a member of the Cichlid family. He's something of a Piscean Austin Powers. Oh, behave, baby. He's the proud owner of a prime bachelor pad, about one square foot of lake bottom. He's dressed for success, or rather, because of it. His dark stripes and sharp colors are the marks of a territory holder. Nearby lurks a male with the dull colors of a wannabe. In fact, he looks just like a female. If fish experience envy, this one covets his neighbor's life. The flashy bachelor invites a female over to suck gravel. This counts as fine dining in these shallows. After dinner, the couple retires to the grotto for a little spawning. There's only so much a guy can take. The wannabe has switched on his colors, a kind of war paint to prepare for battle. The wannabe wins, and he is transformed by victory. He retains his bright colors. His grievances are redressed as much as he himself has been redressed in the wardrobe of a winner. A more profound transformation will soon take place inside his body. In a week, his gonads will plump up 30-fold in weight, and a brain area dedicated to sex will increase eight times in volume. At last, the new bachelor is ready to take his enlarged gonads for a spin. Guided by his bigger brain area for sex, he courts a female with macho motions and furling fins. But no male holds a long-term lease in these gravel beds. The new owner soon discovers the high cost of upkeep for his pad. Neighboring bachelors are always testing the lot lines. A neighbor attacks. territory holder is defeated. He switches off his fancy colors. His gonads and brain region for sex will soon shrink. He rejoins the ranks of the wannabes. Some body changers save their most dramatic transformations for the end of life. Sockeye salmon are beckoned from the ocean back to the Alaskan streams where many hatched five years ago. Some must travel hundreds of miles in an odyssey that can take weeks. Along the way, salmon will undergo one of the most remarkable changes in all of nature. Head shape starts to change. Every salmon will die by the journey's end. The only question is whether they will get the chance to complete their transformation. Many will be stopped here by a terrible gauntlet of brown bears. On this journey of the condemned, the salmon throw themselves up river with abandon.
The salmon that escape, especially the males, will now carry on with their transformation. The head turns green and body red as the fish prepare to die on their own terms. Few have made it this far. Fewer yet will finish the transformation. Approaching the spawning grounds, the males achieve their final shape. A sleek silvery male over a few weeks transforms into a gaudy hunchback with a toothy grimace. The skin turns smooth and unfish-like as the body absorbs its scales. tatters after their journey. Salmon arrive in the shallows where they hatched. They've lost up to a third of their weight, not to mention their looks. Only one in a thousand has completed this harrowing round trip. With her own changed body, a female sweeps out a gravel nest and releases her eggs. A male offers his swirl of milt. This grotesque body change is still a mystery. Does the male's hooked face help in jousting matches with rivals? Does the female choose a male for his new colors a sexy but reckless display that draws the fire of predators. All that's certain is that this change is the creature's last, and perhaps in death, the final transformation. The parents offer their decaying bodies to feed the pools where the next generation will grow. After watching that clip, think about how can the salmon how, how does this salmon spawning strategy, how can this be a benefit for the species? Think about that. Let's, let's pause and think about that. The salmon that make it all the way upstream, they're able to mate. And they will, those fish that made it all the way upstream, those fish are going to be much more likely to be the stronger fish because the weaker fish, they, they just didn't make it. They weren't able to make it upstream. So those strong fish, they're gonna be able to reproduce. Their offspring will also be more likely to be stronger, just like, your, just like their parents. So overall, that's going to be a benefit to the species as a whole because more of the offspring are going to be strong, just like their parents. Here's a creepy photo of a black widow. Now it's time to discuss two main reproductive strategies for species. The first one we're going to call R-selected, and these R-selected organisms have certain traits. R-selected uh, organisms, the R stands for growth rate, and some of the characteristics of these R-selected organisms is that they have a large number of offspring at a time. Think about a uh, dandelion. The, these are all different seeds. And if you think back to last year, we thought about the, uh, the idea of biotic potential. So, so this little flower, I don't know how many, there are hundreds of these seeds, it looks like. If the biotic potential, what that meant is that if the ideal conditions, how many um, of those seeds are going to grow up to be adult plants, this would have a very, very high biotic potential. There's a lot of different seeds, and the seeds just get thrown in the air. They go all over the place, a whole bunch of them. Another characteristic is of our selected is that the offspring have a very low survival rate. So here again, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of tadpoles. Very, very few of them are actually going to survive long enough to become adults. They're going to very few of them will survive long enough to uh, be able to reproduce and have offspring of their own. This is the night they've all chosen to return. With the dawn, 
dead ends. Fifty days later. Hundreds of thousands of two-inch-long turtles soldier their way to the surface. For this newborn and his band of brothers, it will be their longest day. Only five out of a hundred will make it through the next eight hours. Beyond the barricades of driftwood, the open battlefield, 120 feet of deep sand. The enemy forces are waiting. So close, and yet so far. safety of the sea. Another characteristic is minimal parental care, minimal parental investment. The mommies and daddies don't usually take a whole lot of care about these little critters. So they, uh, like for example, they may lay the eggs and then just leave and never see the offspring again. Now the next type is what's called K-selected organisms. And K stands for the carrying capacity. And this is something, again, that we learned about in uh, seventh grade. So you have the carrying capacity means if there's enough resources, the population size will grow, 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 grow. Eventually, it's going to approach the what's called the carrying capacity, where there's not enough resources for the for the population size to keep growing. So the the population size will kind of even off, and uh, the death rate, birth rate will be fairly similar. Versus an R selected species, where there's a whole bunch of new babies, huge amount of uh, offspring but those offspring are not gonna survive very much and so there's a big die off and then that, that cycle just keeps repeating itself. Big boom, die off, boom, die off. So as I said, K stands for carrying capacity. Um, you might also want to think about it as care. That's another way I like to think about it. So, so K for care. It's not the, you know, the scientific way, but it might help you remember it. Some of the characteristics of case-selected organisms. Well, obviously, Malati is a very protective mum, so she's been looking after the cubs inside. But now they've started walking a bit more and wanting to be a little bit more independent. They actually came to the end of the race and they went out into the enclosure for the first time. I think they were a bit overwhelmed by it all, really, because it's such a huge space. Also, mum was keeping a very watchful eye over them because if she's obviously concerned where they're going to be going. She doesn't want them too far away out of her sight. Um, so she did limit them to around the area where they had come out of just to make sure they were safe. But it was wonderful to see. They were all really excited and staggering around. We don't actually know the sex of the three cubs yet. We presume that one that's got a little nickname by the keepers called Trouble is a male because he's always up and about. He's much bigger. 
and he's always exploring everywhere, whether it's jumping out of the box, trying to run away from mom, climbing on his mom's head, and pushing the other two out of the way at feed time. So um, he's a very, very strong character. The one that's shyer, it'll be interesting if it is a little female, because she obviously looks to her mum a lot um, for that confidence, and her mum is very, very aware that she is a lot shyer, and she kind of is very protective over her and carries her around. Two of the cubs were very excited to be outside and were off exploring. The one that held back a little bit was obviously the shire of the three, and Malati went back to pick up that cub to bring it outside to ensure it was with its other little cubs. Um, Malati has been a fantastic mum. I mean, it's really hard work for her. She's young, she's got three cubs. Um, she's busy feeding them, obviously. She's washing them. She's also making sure that she's eating properly, and she's also wanting to have interactions with JJ next door. So her days are pretty, pretty packed, and she's always off doing something. Well, the next stages are they're going to get more and more confident, and they're going to want to be outside a lot more. Um, obviously, the nicer weather is coming with summer on its way, or should I say spring first. So the cubs are going to want to be outside and playing. Um, we've seen great interactions from their dad, who is next door, and he's doing fantastic things um, like watching them, climbing up at the glass, and he's also been doing something which is known as chuffing, which is a really, really good greeting that tigers do to one another. So it's all looking very positive for the future and introducing the little ones to their dad. Okay, case-selected organisms. Case-selected organisms have certain characteristics. A characteristic of case-selected organisms is that they tend to have few offspring versus like the spider, which is disgusting and has hundreds and hundreds of baby spiders. The uh, polar bear, you know, two or three cubs. Another characteristic, high offspring survival rate versus the tadpoles where the vast majority of the tadpoles don't survive or if you remember the clip about the, the sea turtles where a vast number of the sea turtles never make it to the ocean, the uh, case selected species have a high offspring survival rate. So if a baby monkey is born, there's a really good chance it's going to grow to adulthood and eventually uh, be able to reproduce it. Also, there's a high parental investment. It's, they don't just have a baby elephant and then they take off. The baby elephant stays with the mommy for a very, very long time. Um, it's a, a lot of work, it's a lot of energy, but it pays off because that, that helps with that high survival rate of the offspring. We've met Bella, an Asian elephant born July 7th. She's already a bit too big for the children's pool provided by her Fort Worth, Texas Zoo. There was a milk-guzzling white Bengal tiger born in June in Lima, Peru, and <laughs> rare footage uploaded in May by a wildlife conservation project of twin baby gorillas playing in the Rwandan rainforest under the watchful eye of mom. <gasps> then there's the giant hit of the summer, Yuan Zai, the giant baby panda of Taipei. Her cry sounding a lot like that of a human baby. In this footage, she's being reintroduced to her mother after two weeks recovering from an injury. Mom cradled her cub the way a human mom would. Images like these made me wonder, how long do baby animals stay with their mothers? Depends on the animal. Elephants, whose pregnancies last longer than any other mammal, stay with their offspring an average of 16 years. Bella's mom carried her for around 22 months. When the little one finally came out, she wasn't so little. At birth, Bella weighed 330 pounds. Elephant calves can walk two days after they're born. The boys eventually get kicked out of the herd after puberty when they become too rowdy. The girls can stick around with mom for life. 
What about tigers? They can't hunt until they're 18 months old, so stay with their mothers for two to three years before venturing off to find their own territory. What about those baby gorillas? For the first year of their lives, gorillas are nearly always by their mother's side, adolescents lasting between three and six years. In the case of gorillas, it's the females who eventually wander off to prevent inbreeding. And will this baby giant panda ever leave her doting mother? Panda babies are helpless without their mamas for quite some time, unable to walk until five months old. They nurse until they reach one and a half, and then mama is ready to send her progeny off so she can have another baby. Pandas are loners. Once the kids are gone, they're gone. And that's all I have for you tonight, folks. So we'll, uh, we'll see you. And like I said, coming up, we'll have a, another lecture on asexual reproduction as well. Have a great night. Be careful, kids. Bye.